Tranquility du Jour, April 2, 2019. Restore and reflect while nurturing your creative spirit at a gorgeous secluded villa nestled on an Italian hilltop. Indulge in daily yoga, Tuscan cuisine, a Puccini opera, and the magic of Cinque Terre. Join me this July for tranquility in Tuscany. Learn more at KimberlyWilson.com slash Italy. Hello there, this is Kimberly Wilson, and welcome to the 449th edition of Tranquility Du Jour. Delighted to be here with you today, fresh back from Colorado, which I'll share a little bit about. And in this week's edition of Tranquility Du Jour, Rissa Miller and I are talking about her passion for poetry and her brand new book, Good Night Poet. We also discuss her work at Vegetarian Journal and her love of animals. Rissa and I met at Burley Manor Animal Sanctuary a few years ago whenever I hosted my very first yoga and the animals. And I just love the work that she's doing and putting out into the world. She's also a photographer, all sorts of great stuff. You'll learn more in a little bit. Before we dive into hearing from Rissa, I wanted to talk a little bit also about this past weekend out in Colorado, and then also something I just read that I really enjoyed and somebody I just saw that I also enjoyed. So also, if you are new to Tranquility Du Jour, remind you, you can find out more about us over at KimberlyWilson.com. And there's a link to that in the show notes, which can be found at KimberlyWilson.com slash 449. Also, sign up for our weekly weekly to every other week love notes, and you will be getting one in your inbox this week. So look for that. And it also gives you access to Tranquil Treasures, which is a plethora of tools for living with more tranquility. And I do add to that regularly. And if there's anything that you would like added that isn't there, let me know because I like creating new material and putting it up there for my newsletter subscribers. Now, what I wanted to mention is I saw Gretchen Rubin speak last week here at uh, Six and I through Politics and Prose, and she has a new book called Outer Order, Inner Calm, Declutter and Organize to Make Room for Happiness. Now, as I returned home to a desk full of mail (laughs) and um, quite a few piles, I was like, oh, I need to read this book. So I look forward to diving into it. And, you know, it just seems that this is such a hot topic, right, with Marie Kondo and really decluttering and minimal uh, minimalism and uh, minimizing and simplification, you know, have been pretty hot for quite a while. But I look forward to reading this book, hoping for some new tools, and we'll definitely share what I come across. Now, as soon as I arrived in Colorado, I went out there to visit a girlfriend that I have known for, my goodness, I think 30 to 35 years. We used to do mannequin modeling at our local department store in Lawton, Oklahoma, and went to college together and have just kept in touch over the years. And she lives out in Denver. So it was so sweet. We rented a little cabin, a rustic cabin. I'll put up photos on the blog shortly in Idaho Springs, which is absolutely darling, a population of 1,700 people. But I have to say, I mean, it was a really hopping little town, cute little boutiques. I picked up some spices for Tim and some soaps for friends and um, had wonderful meals out, just a really sweet town and had a hot spring. So we did that and soaked in caves that had like 110 degree water. It's quite warm. It's just a lovely experience. And then we also hung out in Evergreen, Colorado, which was super cute and went to a saloon and saw live music, which was just so fun. And it was a cover band playing things from Tears to Fears to ACDC <laughs> to um, Stevie Wonder. It was so fun. And and then yesterday, I headed back to DC, but not before meeting up with a friend who I've known for nearly 20 years, who moved to Denver back in 06. And she was one of my very first teachers at Tranquil Space. And it's just an absolute gem. And you're going to hear from her soon on the podcast because she is doing a CBD uh, a skincare line. And it's amazing. And she's also going to have products that will be in the goodie bags for the upcoming TD, TDJ soiree. So you'll get to hear more uh, about and from Lisa coming shortly. Also, I have to confess that as soon as I arrived in Denver, what do I do? Well, I hop on the train and go straight to Union Station. 
hop off and go straight to Tattered Cover Bookstore. And oh my gosh, like had so much. I was so happy, so happy in there. I think I spent a couple hours. I posted some photos on Instagram and Facebook at uh, Tranquility Du Jour. So you may have seen those. But what I did is I picked up a book called Girl Stop Apologizing by Rachel Hollis, a shame-free plan for embracing and achieving your goals. Now, I'm sure most of you know of Rachel Hollis. She is kind of everywhere these days. And this book just came out. So I thought, well, let me just see, you know, let me thumb through. So I'm thumbing through it. And I was immediately engaged. So picked it up and read it, finished it on a Sunday. So I just wanted to mention that it is actually a pretty darn good book. And, you know, sometimes you can read things and you're like, oh, I've read this before. I've heard this before. But I felt like I got a lot of kind of new insights in this book. And so I hope you too may find a little bit of insight inspiration in it. And then again, I can't speak to out of order in our column yet, but it does look like a pretty fun new book. And um, also, I wanted to mention you're probably fully aware April 1st was yesterday. So it's time to pin those April goals. And so April dreams as I was on the plane back yesterday, I was pinning mine and I didn't have any like cute paper. I did have washi tape, but no cute paper. So I just wrote them with a ballpoint pen and then we'll go back, put in some cute paper, washi tape, and then write them with a Sharpie. And of course, take a moment to review what were your dreams for April or for March? What were you hoping for? How did those unfold? How are those feeling? And I'll just give you an example. Okay, so I was looking back over my March ones. One was learn lots at conference. Okay, so I was at a psychotherapy networker conference which I believe I've already mentioned, and Malcolm Gladwell spoke, and he was amazing. Anyway, and it was uh, so many great tools, particularly on anxiety and OCT. But anyway, that one's a little hard to measure, right? Learn lots. <laughs> Not super specific, but I, I actually did learn lots, so I noted that. I also have um, therapy supervision. So I've recently um, found an amazing supervisor, a PhD psychologist to kind of work with to, um, you know, help with all of my my wonderful clients and deepening my support for them. You know, of course, working with clients, hosting a fun book launch vet. Hopefully that was fun for everyone who attended on International Women's Day. Um, I had that I wanted to do 15 ballet classes. Unfortunately, I only got nine in, which was a little disappointing. But looking at my schedule, I actually only could have attended 10. So I only missed one. I was just a little overly zealous, apparently, whenever I, I wrote my goal. I have four podcasts done, two to four love notes done, uh, read two books. I did not, you know, I may have actually done that. Um, if not, I got really close to finishing one, but I did read the other one over the weekend. And then also um, finishing the compassion fatigue module of veterinary social work did not get that done. So that will move over to April. You know, so it's just kind of nice to look at and see like, okay, what are the things that I listed as priorities for last month? How did they go? And then what are some new priorities? So I'll give an example I wrote over on my um, April dreams, you know, that I would have, that I would finish that compassion fatigue veterinary social work module, that I would get my taxes done. That, of course, is reliant on my accountant, but I am hopeful and will be nudging her uh, that I will complete the day book. So you may recall I mentioned in last week's love note or, or last week's podcast, and then also I put in the blog last week, the progress of the day book. It's so cute. It's coming along nicely. And it just needs my attention to get it all wrapped up. So my goal is to have that done by the end of April, 12 ballet classes, and I have decreasing phone time and I don't have just decreased phone time. I said to one to two hours a day. So that's just a few of the things. Oh, and 40 people at our Pigs, Pugs, and Pino event that's coming up on April 28th. And hopefully some of you can join us. We're selling lots of tickets for it. And I think it's going to be a really sweet, fun event. It's $25. All proceeds benefit Pigs and Pugs Project. And that in turn helps improve the lives of pigs and pugs everywhere. And I'll actually be doing two donations uh, today or tomorrow, one to Pig Preserve and one to the Houston Pug Rescue that just picked up this six-month-old puppy pug that is just in super bad shape and needs a lot of medical care. And then the Pig Preserve rescued a pig from a really horrific abuse situation and is nursing this pig back to health. So going to be making donations, micro grants to both of those. So 
Every time you support the work of Tranquility Du Jour or Tranquility, you in turn help Pigs and Pugs Project, which ideally is making the lives of pigs and pugs happier everywhere. All right, so that's just a few updates happening over at Tranquility Du Jour Land, Kimberly Wilson Land. Also, I wanted to mention the Yoga and the Animals, which I touched on earlier. That's happening Saturday, June 8th, and that's in Ellicott City, Maryland. Would love to have you join, and there's a link in the show notes. Also, the upcoming TD Chase Soiree happening on June 9th in D.C. at a fine dining establishment named Number 6 V vegan friendly resto in the freaking world. And then of course, we're going to have hours of programming, a little mini fashion show, a tranquility pop up, lots of connection time and community and lots and lots of treats. Oh, and amazing vegan dining. So would love to have you join for that. There are VIP and general admission tickets available. Also, save the date for our next TDJ Live, which is June 23rd. And if you missed our spring one, there's a link in the show notes to download the replay, which is $10. And again, proceeds benefiting Pigs and Pugs Project. And then last but not least, the last thing that I have scheduled for 2019 as of now is Tranquility in Tuscany. That's July 13th through the 20th, and we now have only four spots left. So if you would like to escape wherever you may be right now and join me, I would love to have you and host you and walk you through the work of art journaling, mindfulness, and of course, yoga for all levels. Rissa Miller is a working artist living in Maryland. She loves early morning light filtering through stained glass, hot green tea and antique teacups, huge salads picked fresh from the garden and walks in the woods with her husband and their canine companion Valerio. She studied writing at NYU and Tisch School of the Arts and photojournalism at Western Kentucky University. When she's not writing, she finds her way to local theater and dance performances loves baking vegan cupcakes, works as support crew for her husband's OCR team, Mud Not Blood, and as often as possible gets lost in libraries. Welcome, Rissa. Thank you so much, Kimberly. I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm delighted to have you, and congratulations on your new book, Good Night Poets, or Good Night Poets, singular, poems to share at bedtime. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about this? So Good Night Poet is my first chapbook in almost two decades. I um, took a little break from writing poetry, obviously. <laughs> And um, it was inspired by a very longstanding tradition that I have of reading a poem at bedtime. I started in high school, and I I couldn't have articulated it to you then. But I think what I love is the transition of, you know, the the sort of the ritual of having that, you know, beautiful sing-song poem right before bed to sort of break away from the busyness of the day and going into sleep. I love that. I love where you mentioned that, you know, in the in the very beginning of the book about how that's a, a regular theme between you and your husband to do the reading. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, when I got married, um, I started reading poems to my husband, Nathaniel, at that time. And sometimes he reads to me as well. And so it's just it has been a, a, a lifelong tradition for me, even wh- whether or not I'm writing poems or reading the work of others. And do you have a favorite poem within your book? So they're probably all like your dearly loved children, but sometimes one (laughs) stands out. And so I'm curious if you do and if you would be willing to read it. Gosh, um, I will read it for you now. Shepherdess was inspired by three sheep at the Lancaster Farm Sanctuary. And um, we visited Lancaster Farm Sanctuary and uh, had a work day. And then that night, I was thinking about the sheep that were there, um, Gertrude, Patrick, and Abby. And I was thinking how odd it is that people count sheep to go to sleep instead of imagining snuggling with them. And that's kind of what inspired this piece. Sleepless, some people imagine a row of round, woolly bodies prancing over neat board fences. They stride on small hooves hurting humans towards slumber. But ask yourself, what's in it for the sheep? Parade of neutral.
natural mundane, their masks of black or honey brown cued nose to tail, why wouldn't sheep prefer to press a soft muzzle to your cheek? Nod in contentment as clouds linger across the moon. Sheep know faces. They see you feelingly. They wouldn't bypass a friend to patter one by one till dawn when they could choose to engulf you in fuzzy nose kisses. Not everyone can be a shepherdess. You must allow a break in the procession. Protect them with each wiggly wag of their tails. Sheep need rest, too. How lucky at twilight when the sheep sniff your skin, their nostrils a cozy tickle. They huddle close in the lush fields of your heart, curled shoulder to hawk in the straw. Weave your fingers in fleece. Ease into their gentle bleating as you drift over worn fences through the open gates of dust. Hmm, beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, and I love that, you know, these are um, sweet little sheep that you met at a sanctuary. And, you know, mm -hmm. It is what I love about sanctuaries, too, is that they're all given names and you really get to know them and their personalities. And so, you know, you, mm -hmm. you get the vibe of of a sheep's personality here. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, I as I was thinking about these three sheep, I was remembering their individual voices and how um, Patrick the, would come up and, and press his soft muzzle to your cheek if you were squatted down next to him. And it was the sweetest, most adorable, loving sentiment from from him. And I uh, I thought I would much prefer that to watching sheep jump, you know, over fences in a row if I was trying to go to sleep. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, one thing. Okay, so you mentioned reading poetry before bed, and who are some of your go tos? And do you, you know, like, do you have favorite poems or poets? Um. You know, I've recently been exposed, maybe in the past 10 years, to David White, who I'm sure you know, David mm -hmm. White. And of course, we all know and love mm -hmm. Mary Oliver and, you know, Derek Walcott. Like, I'm just trying to think of a few that, you know, I'll read from for, for workshops or events. And I'm curious for mm -hmm. you, like, do you have favorites or, you know, poems that you would recommend that uh, us as listeners check out? Well, poetry is a very individual thing, and um, what speaks to one person won't necessarily resonate with everyone. Um, I always say that poetry is, is literature's version of painting. Um, it's not what you look at, it's what you see kind of thing. Um, you can look at a painting all day, and you'll never see the same thing as the person standing next to you who's looking at the same painting. And I feel like poetry is that way as well. Um, for me personally, Personally, I, I have read a lot of different poets over the years. I will frequently pick up a book by someone I've never heard of just to read it and check it out. And sometimes that works out great. Other times it's not as great. But um, And then sometimes when I return to it, it I find that it, it's, it's changed and, or I've changed perhaps. And those poems resonate with me later. Um, lately, I, I have a book by Pablo Neruda who is one of my favorite poets. <laughs> yes. Um, I do. I love his voice. And um, the poet who made me fall in love with poetry is William Carlos Williams. And I never, I never get tired of William Carlos Williams writing. And I, to this day, you know, this, you know, the, the short poem, this is to say that I've eaten the plums that you put in the icebox and we're probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious. So sweet and so cold. It can mean anything. <laughs> and um, I think that was the moment when I first, as, as a teenager, when I, I saw beyond like the Shakespearean sonnets that we were forced to read in high school and realized that poetry can be something else. Not that there's anything wrong with sonnets. Um, but yeah, I love going into a used bookstore and just seeing what poetry books are there and what treasures I can, can leave with. Yeah, it's... Um... I think one of the pieces, though, about poetry, and, 
you know, I think it's hard if you're a poet to be like, how can people not understand them? But, you know, I, there's so much <laughs> subtext, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, for those of us who may struggle at times with reading poetry, if it's not like super in your face or, you know, where you just have to reread it and reread it and reread it, and then you're like, ah, you right. know, it's almost like an emotion that you get from it versus even maybe like, oh, I wonder what the poet actually meant by that. So what would you say, like, mm -hmm. are some tips that you would share for anyone who struggles with reading poetry? Um, that maybe you just haven't found the right poet. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jill Silverstein wrote some amazing poetry that I think almost anybody can appreciate, for example. And um, that definitely is just as much poetry as the most literary scholarly poem you can find. Um, I think that um, to really learn to understand poetry, you have to find an appreciation in yourself for the beauty of words. And ultimately, that's what poetry is. It is a, a different appreciation for words than any other kind of writing that you can do. I mean, I've had a career in journalism. I am also a playwright. I write fiction and nonfiction. And none of those things are like poetry. They they exist in a different space in my mind. And um, I think that as a writer and as a reader, I experience those kinds of writing, the, the more long form, very differently than poetry. Um, I think finding the right poet for you to read personally can be a journey. Um, that's what libraries are great for. You can go and look at a bunch. And if the first three books don't mean anything to you, you, you don't get it. Um, there might be something in the fourth or fifth. I mean, you might really um, enjoy hearing hearing poetry, too, instead of reading it. Um, it's one of those rare forms of writing, aside from perhaps script writing, that is best experienced um, in an audio way versus visually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So poetry reading can be a very different experience than sitting alone with a book. Right, right. I, I love what you, you, you say by that, because it is, it's such an auditory sort of experience. Um you know, mm -hmm. to really, yeah, to hear someone. And even if it's a poem you think you know and you hear somebody read it, they might read it in such a way that it, it suddenly takes on a new meaning. I've I've definitely heard that happen. Different writers read their work. And I was like, oh, I, I, I'm hearing something different now than what I meant, thought that meant. And um, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's just like a painting. You keep looking at it and seeing new things. Right, right. No, I love that. I think that's such a good reminder. And it is, it's like, it, it, there's layers, right? So you're like, maybe you get the top layer initially. <laughs> and then you just keep mm -hmm. peeling it and you get more. Are there any, so you mentioned Shel Silverstein, of course, The Giving Tree. Love that book. Um, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's such a good book. But would you say, like, are there any others that you're like, uh, as a gateway sort of drug into poetry that you would recommend that reader or our listeners maybe start with reading or listening i think it, i mean a lot of it depends on where you're coming from um i mean the writing of of mia angelou for example she has children's books that are fantastic and they're written in such a way that the poems in them are completely understandable to a child um and then she has other poems that are so sophisticated that um you have to think really hard about them when you read them, of course. Um, I love Nikki Giovanni. Her voice is very clear and articulate. She has a very strong way of writing. Um, and I don't think that there's any mistaking her voice. So it's, just, it's a great, um, great to pick up one of her collected works. So, I mean, I aside from that, um, anthologies are cool because there's a mixture of stuff in them. Um, you can have some really old poems from the 1700s and things that are very modern, all in the same book. And you can find out what resonates for you. Yeah, thank you. I, I do think, um, it, you know, having a sort of like, okay, here are some, some great ones to just get started with or to try or that, you know, and then like even, you know, I picture something to the left of like, here's the poem. And to the right, here is what, you know, like somebody who really uh, knows and loves 
poetry would say are kind of like the main takeaways or the nuggets from it. And, you know, sometimes uh-huh, that can be really uh-huh. helpful, right, to train your eye. It's kind of like going and looking at a painting at the National Gallery mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, a curator who is like, oh, did you see this in the boating party? Did you see mm-hmm, that? And you're mm-hmm. like, oh, my gosh, I totally missed it. Well, you know, it's interesting, too, because like I said, you, you know, if you're with a curator, an expert, you might learn a history of a painting or poem that's totally different than what you thought you saw. Um, the classic Lord Byron poem, She Walks in Beauty. I had a very different picture in my mind every time I heard of it or heard the poem or read it of than what he actually wrote it about. And um, I recently was um, browsing around online and I believe it was poetry.com has poems and then what inspired the writer to write them like in, in the, the next paragraph. Turns out he was writing about his friend's wife which is never what I imagined when I read She Walks in Duty. It was this beautiful love sonnet to his friend's wife. Wow. I always thought it was to his I always thought it was to his own love, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I guess she was his love, but you know, she was also his friend's wife. But I, I was so surprised when I read the actual history of She Walks in Duty and um I was a little like stepped back for a second. I was like, after all these years that I've I've loved this poem and, and knew it since, you know, what like eighth grade when they first had us read it <laughs> I never had it would have guessed it was about his buddy's wife right so. yeah yeah that's always <laughs> interesting whenever you get the history of something and you're like oh this tells me so much more uh-huh absolutely so tell us a little bit about your work at the vegetarian journal like i love that you are an editor there and you know it's not just poetry right? You have this whole other part of yourself. And I know you're a photographer and you've got all these like wonderful things going on. So can you tell us about your work there? Right. Like your favorite part, biggest challenges? You know, I think it's always interesting to to hear from people who work in, in publications and who, um, you know, have these different roles of like, huh, how, you know, what's your day to day like? And, and what's your favorite part? Well, I do love working at an all vegan publication with an all vegan st- Staff. And uh, that's kind of, I, I feel a little bit spoiled to be totally honest. Um, I get paid to do work that I really love. <laughs> um, and this is going to sound like the funniest thing you've ever heard. But when I've worked in corporate or large offices before, even small offices, I was always bothered by the break room microwave. As a vegan, I hated that it always smelled like meat or fish. And now I work at an all vegan uh, business and um, the microwave smells awesome in the break room because it always smells like vegan food and vegetables. So that's like a tiny little perk, but I love it. Um, So the Vegetarian Journal is a quarterly magazine and I'm the senior editor. I started last May. I handle the design, the assigning. Um, I've been handling the cover photography with my husband, Nathaniel, for a while. And now we, we've expanded doing a little bit more photography inside as well, sort of dress the pages up, bring it to life. And um, I, hmm, I think the work is super enjoyable. I get to work with recipes and reviews and articles and travel pieces. They're all vegan focused and um, keep spreading out um, this, this great information. Um, we have a scientific review um, that comes out every month as well, or I'm sorry, every issue as well. And it's uh, really uh, fantastic information, very up to date. Um, so working with the writers is really fun. Working with my boss is great. She's um, a super supportive and very enthusiastic person. So I'm incredibly lucky. <laughs> so uh, even when I came in with a crazy idea, she always entertains it. And we usually go with it because she's, She really um, supports and believes in the vision I have for the magazine. And how long have you been there? Since May. So not quite a year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Very cool. And um, how how can we find out more about the magazine? Like, I assume we can subscribe. You can subscribe. Um, You can get it on Kindle. Uh, So you just go on Amazon and type in Vegetarian Journal and you can get electronic copies of it. And um, you can still get a paper copy, you know, the old fashioned mail to your mailbox paper magazine. And um, you just go to um, the Vegetarian Resource Group's website and click on the Vegetarian Journal. 
And, you know, I, I would have to say, I mean, they're saying 2019 is the year of the vegan, right? And I'm, I'm just curious, have you noticed an influx in readership or in subscriptions? Um, not yet, but that would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, um, I would love to see a bump in subscriptions, especially the electronic ones. That would be great. And we only went on to Kindle, I think, in the past year. So um, it's a new space for us, and it's really exciting to see, you know, those those e-subscriptions starting to climb. It's, it's cool. And tell us a little bit about your journey to veganism. Like, how long have you been vegan? And, um, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. where did you get started? Well, I've been vegan 24 years. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, the long and short of it is that... Um, when I was 19, I started to get very, very sick. And by the time I was 20, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. And um, it's an autoimmune disorder that affects the digestive tract, mostly the lower GI. And um, I had a, a doctor who, um, in retrospect, was a little questionable, perhaps. He, um, he wanted to just take out my colon. And then he told me, there's no hope for me that even though I was only 20, that I wouldn't live to see 30 and that I should drop out of college. I should never decide to get married. I should basically move back in with my mom and dad and wait to die. And I was a very stubborn uh, 20 year old. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't think that that was correct. I, I was adamantly thinking there must be a better way or another way or something to hope for. So I went to see a registered dietitian, and she had just finished reading the McDougal program by John McDougal, um, just very coincidentally. And she told me, you know, this doctor in Los Angeles, I think, um, has this crazy diet plan, but it might work. You should try it because you have nothing to lose. And uh, within seven months, I was completely well. (laughs) So, um, you know, I had always wanted to be a vegetarian, but I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. And I remember the girls who were vegetarians didn't always have it super easy. Um, the uh, other kids in the high school would make fun of them. I remember this one girl was walking through the cafeteria once. Somebody threw lunch meat on her. And I didn't want to be any weirder than I already was being, you know, an artsy kid. So I didn't go vegetarian before, even though I really wanted to. And then when the dietitian handed me the book and I saw it was a vegan diet, and I actually had not heard the word vegan until that point. I was like, this is just kind of meant to be. I was already thinking that I wanted to go on this path because I didn't want to eat animals. And here I am receiving this information that this diet could be the thing that will save my life too. So it did. And um, I've just never looked back. It's been a perfect fit for me. Well, and speaking of animals... We met, of course, at Burley Manor Animal Sanctuary, where you volunteer. (laughs) And my goodness, I think it was four years ago, because I think it was our very first one. And so that means you've been there a while. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I have been there a while. I think I might have been there longer than four years, actually. Um, I love Burley Manor. It is a (laughs) a magical place. hidden in the middle of Ellicott City. (laughs) And um, the animals there and the people who live there are all sort of um, just wonderful, wonderful spirits. I I love doing the events there because it is a great outreach opportunity for, you know, anyone at all, whether they're already vegan and have never met animals or, you know, they're vegetarian and they're thinking of going vegan or they're, you know, an omnivore and have never met animals and don't understand Yet, they haven't crossed that um, bridge to the point where they see an animal the way that um, they see, you know, maybe their pet. Um, The moment when I'm giving a tour and I see it in somebody's face that they've connected with a pig or a goat um, or, you know, any one of the the beautiful animals at the sanctuary is is the, the reason I go, the reason I love going there, the reason I... I'm happy to help. Um, that connection between souls is just so beautiful. And let's talk about Mabel because she's like my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I have well, it thing. is the year of the pig as well, right? I know, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So Mabel, <laughs> listeners, Mabel is, oh my gosh, is lovely, yeah. adorable. She's such a lovely, lovely girl. Uh, you know, she was a runt, right? Um, they got her at the state fair, kind of like Babe in the movie, who was a runt that you know, worthless runt nobody wanted. Mabel was the worthless runt that nobody wanted, and she went home with Lisa and Larry, and she initially lived in the house with them when she was a baby. <laughs> So she's she's awesome. I I absolutely love Mabel, and she does love a good belly rub. <laughs> they all do. And how how much does she weigh now? Would you say is she like four hundred, five hundred pounds? I, I was going to say between four and five hundred pounds. She doesn't look like a runt to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, she's adorable. And listeners, if you are interested, Yoga and the Animals is happening June 8th. And um, will you be there, Rissa? Will you be volunteering? Absolutely. I will be there and I will um, probably be one of your tour guides. Oh, wonderful. Um, and so it's just, it's always such a fun day. And you took such great photos last year. And we do yoga and have a yummy vegan meal and we get to meet the animals, a private tour. And it's just like absolutely delightful. And yeah, Lisa has just done an amazing job there. And everyone who works there does seem really amazing. But the great thing is, it's like freaking so close to DC. You know, it's less than an hour from Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And hidden in this neighborhood, which is so funny. It is. It's really peculiar because everybody thinks they're in the wrong place. And then suddenly out of nowhere, there's this farm in the middle of a uh, subdivision. But the history, though, of Burley Manor is that it originally was 10,000 acres. So all that subdivision around it would have belonged to the property. So, Rissa, one thing we have also come into contact as, um, you know, animal activists at an event. I remember last National Day of Pig on March 1st, we had a showing of the mm -hmm. last pig and you came. And I remember somehow I think Jean Bauer mentioned that Nathaniel had a kombucha company or line or something. And I, I didn't know that, but I love kombucha. And so I wanted to ask uh -huh. you about it. And this is totally random. But you know, why is kombucha <laughs> considered so good for the gut? Oh, easy question. Um, so kombucha is a live probiotic food, um, just like um, sauerkraut, or, you know, your cultured yogurt, uh, you know, and um, like forager, things like that. And um, it basically has live probiotics in it that will populate your gut. And all, all probiotic foods are different, so they all have different bacteria. So they all affect your gut slightly differently. Kombucha is made from tea. And uh, the bacteria that like kombucha will eat the caffeine. And they'll also eat a little bit of sugar that's brewed with the tea. So it's not terribly sweet. If you've had it, you know it's kind of tart, almost vinegary. Um, you still get the tea flavor and you get some bubbles from the fermenting process. So it's it's a really fun drink. It's it's really different and there's really nothing else that tastes quite like kombucha. But yeah, it's it's good for you because of the probiotics. Yeah, because I, as I was drinking some today, a turmeric ginger one, what is that? I think it's by Kavita, mm. you know, it's just, I'm always like, oh, this mm -hmm. is good for anti-inflammation. You know, it's like good anti-inflammatory. Right. And um, so yeah, I was like, oh, I want to ask Rissa about that because, you know, I think kombucha is, it's such like a, a fun thing, you know, people love drinking it, but then it's uh -huh. kind of like, okay, why? Like, what are the health benefits behind it? Because you hear so much about it. Right. So my last question for you is the name of this podcast is Tranquility Du Jour. So I'm curious for you, how do you find tranquility in your everyday? Well, for one thing, I love spending time with my gal go. Um, he is a Spanish greyhound. His name is Valerio, but we mostly call him the dude. And um, no matter what has gone on in my day, when I see his adorable little houndy face smiling at me out of the window, the front, uh, the front windows, I, I know I'm home and I know everything is fine. And I know that his tail will be wagging to see me. Um, so hanging out with the dude is definitely a, a, a peaceful experience for me. Going for nice long walks. He loves walking in the woods. And it's funny, sort of as like the peace settles over him when he's outside, I, I feel it too. So it's a, a wonderful sort of bonding moment between us. I love reading. Um, I, I will disappear into a book for <laughs> hours and hours. And I uh, would always say that I would find tranquility in that because you're sort of escaping into someone else's mind, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you are 
hopefully it's a good book and you are hopefully able to um, willingly suspend your disbelief and just disappear into their their world. And um, I love dancing. I, I used to be a professional dancer. Oh, so still. Yeah. <laughs> um, to this day, especially if no one is watching, I will still turn music on and dance. And what type of dance were you professionally? I did Middle Eastern dance and um, also known as belly dancing. <laughs> ah. And um, I, yeah, I, that was what I performed, but I studied many other kinds of dance. I studied jazz, I studied ballet, I studied flamenco, I did a little bit of um, Polynesian hula. I, um, I loved all those forms of dance, but you know, Middle Eastern dance definitely had my heart. Um, I think I was initially seduced by the music and the costumes, but the movement um, to this day still just speaks to my soul. Mm, there is something so beautiful about moving in general, right? Particularly when there's music mm-hmm. associated, live music in particular. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rissa. Thank you for being here with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Kimberly. I really appreciate it. Savvy Sources, you can find Rissa at RissaWrites.com. And there's also a link to her book, Good Night Poet, in the show notes. There's also a link to the TDJ Live Spring Replay, the upcoming day book, a little blurb about that, and then also Vegetarian Journal, where Rissa writes. And of course, you can find us online. Instagram and Facebook are the main spots where I spend time. Also over on YouTube. And there are some great new videos on the capsule wardrobe, two on that. And then also 21 Looks of Tranquility, where I show just a bunch of different outfits that are pulled together from the Tranquility Collection. And then finally, of course, Year of Tranquility, my latest book, that came out in January and it comes with five bonuses. And there's a link to that in the show notes. You can also find it at Kimberly Wilson slash Y-O-T. There's also a link to Tranquility, my sixth book. So there's five others, Tranquility Filled e-courses, which will be switching up shortly, the Tranquility to Shore podcast app for iPhone and Android, and then read about my passion for animals. Finally, if you have a moment to pen a review on iTunes or share this podcast via social media, would be so grateful. My hope is it helps others find a dose of tranquility in their everyday. And if you have a moment to pen a review of any of my books on Amazon or Goodreads, would be so, so grateful. And of course, post and share using hashtag Year of Tranquility. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to Rissa. Thank you to you for being here. And I wish you a really, really great week ahead. Namaste.